Yeah, there we go. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll just take this and walk around a little bit. Uh, so, hello, welcome to like the first slide. Hey, talk about the new animation system. So, my name is Sibigan. I'm presenting here with Christoph and with Nathan. Uh, we are the animation and rigging like paid developers. There is oh well. Just as I pointed out, Nate, there's other people involved with the module, and uh, we're just here to present like the group effort. That's what I want to start out with. Um, so this is a bit of a progress report. So we'll talk about what we've done and what we're going to do, or at least what we would like to do, and then what in practice we're working on. We'll we'll see when we work on it. Um, so last time we talked about stuff. We talked about animation 2025, like big project, bring Blender to the future, make it ready for the next decade. Um, and so that's where our mind went. And so we want to do like big, cool things, like having a rig node system. Uh, we want to have bone pickers like this, where you can just easily select bones regardless of whether you can see them, regardless of your point of view, and just work nicely. Um, we want to have related animation kept together because like in the same way that not every bone has its own action, like sometimes maybe like things that are not in one armature, you may also want to put into the same action. Um, and especially with animation like this, where like a prob and two characters are so intertwined, you cannot really see this as three separate things being animated. And we want to have other things like animation level constraints where you just put the fact that there are these constraints inside of the action so that you can link it into your lighting file instead of having to copy the constraints there as well. Uh, we want to have example-based drivers where you just say, well, just, if the arm is like this, that shape key should be like that and then it should be gone uh, without having to set up all the mathy bits in the drivers. Uh, we want to have multiple rest poses for armature or maybe even rest poses for non-armature things. And uh, there's like so many things that we want to do all by 2025. That's not going to happen. So, <laughs> surprise. Um, in the past year, we also had a bit of a, a switch over, and some of you may have seen like Project Baklava. That was just a temporary name. I just, just wanted to mention that we're not using the name anymore, but we're still working on that stuff. Um, but we had to pick something instead of thinking about like big ideas and, and the, the far future. Uh, we had to do more concrete things. And the thing we thought was good to start working on is layered animation. Like currently, the action is just a dumb bag of F curves. And there's nothing really like smart in there. There is no complexity, which is a good thing, but also means that if we want to put constraints in there as well, it's going to be impossible. But like constraints in there is already hard. So let's stick to animation for now and just add layers so that you can have like a, a run layer and a facial animation layer and you can just turn off the running and then do basic face animation and then turn the running back on again and etc. And you might say, well, but Sibylin, we already have the NLA. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> thanks to, to Nate and Brad and many other people who have put a lot of effort into, is this me, the rumbling? Ah, uh, neighbors. Um, so well, thanks to a lot of people, the NLA has seen a lot of improvements over the years. And we did a little bit of digging into the history and it turns out to be older than I thought it was. So it's even older, like it's from the age where actions could only be assigned to objects and to nothing else. And so it's old. Um, I also want to thank Tal, Tal Herkovich uh, for making the animation layers add-on because that's also like really nice way of like using the NLA as sort of a thing we use in the backdrop. But like the best add-on developers cannot fix the fundamental problems of the NLA um, because like every strip has its own action. That means that every object has its and every object has like its own set of tracks and strips and and you get you get stuff like this. this is like and you have to keep all of them in sync if you want to do like layered animation 
and this also doesn't link into other files. And I was like, Nathan made this uh, screenshot, and I was like, oh, look at that, it's such a mess. It's like five different actions for just a cube, and it's like the simplest scene you can have with just a cube, a light, and a, and a camera. And he's like, no, no, no. No, we have five strips there, or six even, with like different names because they're different strips and they have to have a unique name. Uh, but there's actually three actions. <laughs> so one of the things that we want to solve in the layered animation system is that your layers are not limited to one object. So we want to put related animation together in, in like one action. And we want to be able to put like related stuff on the same layer. Maybe you split it up per layer, per object, that's however you want to work, but they definitely have to go into the same action. So instead of one object having many different strips with each of the strip yet another action, we're going to pop that inside out and have one action that contains the layers and maybe layer strips and can be used by multiple objects at the same time. Uh, and like the end goal is to just replace the NLA completely, but we can only do that when we get feature parity. So basically there's two ingredients in all of this. And that is one, we want to have multiple layers in the same action. And number two is we want to animate different things from within that action. And looking at how complex is it to build the second one if we built the first one, or built the first one after we built the second one, it became obvious that layers is a more simple thing, like people understand how it should work, other software has it as well, but actions and then combining different things in there, that's more tricky, more technical. Uh, so that's why I just walk over to Nathan because he can talk about that. Hi. So, uh, yeah, we wanted actions to be able to animate more than one object, more than one data block. Uh, and the solution we came up with for that, we call slotted actions. Woo! Okay, so, uh, the thing that's nice about slotted actions and just the general concept of animating more than one thing in a single action is that it's not just preparation for animation layers, it's actually useful even on its own already. So for example, uh, well, there was the example that Seaburn showed before with the, the sheep and the angel, if you've seen the Cosmos Blender ad, um, uh, interacting. And it's nice to keep those sorts of tight interactions within the same action, especially if you're in a production situation and you're going to be linking that animation into other files. It's nice to keep that in one organized place so you don't have to keep track of like, okay, this action, this action, this action, and this action all belong together to define one animation. So it's nice to put that in one place. Uh, game animation libraries have like a similar thing. If you're building up an animation library, you can have a character that has an articulated weapon or you know whatever, or could, could be two characters that are interacting. Again, you kind of want to keep that in one place so you don't have to manually keep track that this action, this action, and this action, and this action go together, need to be exported together, need to be you know, kept tied together. If you can just put that in one action, that makes that whole management problem way easier. Also, uh, who here is uh, familiar with uh, kind of Blender's data model where you have like objects, but then object data that's separate from that? Yeah. So cameras also follow that. So you have the camera object, which defines its motion in space, but you actually have separate camera data that defines its zoom, uh, like its focal plane, like all those sorts of things. And those both actually get separate actions right now. So if you animate a camera fully using all the things, you actually get two different actions, even though that's really conceptually one animation. So there's another thing that's like, hey, it'd be nice to put these in the same action together. Uh, meshes have the same kind of thing. You have the mesh object, you have the mesh data, you have shape keys, uh, but also you might even animate it with more than one object. If you have uh, empties that are hooked onto certain vertices to do interesting deformations, uh, that animation is then going to be multiple objects as well. Again, one conceptual animation right now goes into a ton of different actions. It'd be nice to keep those together. Object rigs. So, uh, has anyone here ever run into the situation where you just want to knock out a quick rig and you don't want to go through all the bother of creating a big armature rig just to animate a simple thing? 
Yeah. So uh, it's nice to be able to just toss together some objects, some empties, toss in some constraints, and just directly animate that. But if you do that, every single one of those objects, again, gets its own action. So there's another case where it's like, hey, would be nice to put those in one action together. Metaballs. I, I love metaballs. You guys love metaballs? Yeah. Uh, so one blobby mess, 50 different objects. You know, same thing. Uh, also, if you are working with baking simulations, you might have like a brick wall getting smashed. You could have, you know, hundreds or thousands of individual objects. You want to bake that uh, simulation down into an action, but it's not going to be one action. It's going to be hundreds or thousands of actions, one for each object. So that's awful. That's really bad. Um, so there's another situation where it'd be really nice to be able to put that bake simulation into a single action. So that's some of the use cases. Uh, but what's the mental model here? Kind of how do you think about actions? Or how do you think about slots? And uh, the first really important thing is uh, if you don't have the spare brain cells, I'm not saying you guys are stupid. Uh, I am, but you guys aren't. Uh, if you don't have the spare brain cells to think about, you just want to sit down in Blender, you just want to insert some keys, you can totally do that. You actually don't have to worry about slots. The same way that right now, you don't have to worry about actions. You can just start keying things. Blender takes care of creating all the actions, hooking them up for you. It'll do the same thing for slots. You don't have to worry about it. But if you do care, you're going to want to know how it works. So how does it work? Well, let's walk through a really simple example. Uh, this is not an example where it's like the, the most important use case, uh, but it's just to help to illustrate it. So we're going to talk about two character rigs. We have a fox rig, and we have a robot rig. And let's first take a look at what this looks like with the current system, with kind of what we're calling old actions, even though the new slotted actions aren't until 4.4. But, you know, old actions. So like Seaburn was saying, uh, the current actions are just this dumb bag of f-curves. Uh, but there are some really nice things about the way that actions work. So for example, uh, you have the fox rig here. You can point it at the fox action, and it will be animated by that. You point the robot rig at the robot action, it will be animated by that. The actions don't push their animation onto the objects. The objects kind of subscribe to the action. Uh, and if we wanted to, we could actually have the robot rig subscribe to the fox action as well, and then they would both be animated by that action. The problem is, since they're just a dumb bag of f-curves, you know, you have the location x, y, z in the fox action, also location x, y, z in the robot action, but there can only be one of those, uh, like there can only be one location x, f-curve in each of those actions. So if you point both of these at the fox action, they're both going to animate like a fox. They're both going to get that same animation. And that is where slotted actions come in. So with slotted actions, you can have more than one location x, uh, location x f curve in an action. And they're organized by slot. So you have slot fox in this case and slot robot. And the action contains animation data, distinct animation data for each of those slots. You can add as many slots as you want, but in this case, we just have the two. And uh, it's other than that, this is basically exactly the same as the existing model. You point the fox rig at the action, you point the robot rig at the action, but now there's just one additional thing that you also have to specify, which is which slot inside the action does it use. So as you might guess, in this case, we have the fox rig pointing at the action, saying that, hey, I'm going to use the fox slot. That also sounds kind of like a dance. <laughs> like, I think, yeah, foxtrot is a dance. Yeah. yeah. Animation, you know? <laughs> um, so, and then of, of course the robot rig, it points at that same action, but specifies that, hey, I'm using the robot slot. So it gets animated by the animation data for the robot slot. And now, both characters are animated by the same action. Woo! Yeah. I think it's exciting. <laughs> So let's take a look at what this looks like in Blender. So uh, we have here yeah, something you guys might be familiar with, which is the action selector. Uh, so this is in the action editor. 
So this represents the action for the active object. You have an object selected, it'll show up uh, here. Uh, and already you could select which action you wanted the object to be animated by. But now you also have a slot selector. So the main difference is just that everywhere that there used to be an action selector, there is now a pair of selectors. You have the action and the slot selector, and you have to select both to specify what animation uh, the object or whatever is going to be animated by. Uh, there's other places where we have uh, action selectors and now also slot selectors. Uh, so for example, in the... Uh, yeah, camera data, data where the zoom and whatnot are specified. Uh, you can also... Dutch person to point at it. <laughs> yeah. I'm too short. <laughs> um, but in the camera data, but in all of the properties editor, in all the properties editors, you will see these action selectors and slot selectors that let you select the animation that a given data block is animated by. So another thing to point out is this indeed is the action editor. It's not the dope sheet, but you'll see that there is uh, animation for you know, camera motion, camera zoom, and also for a hat. So that's, that's that hat up there. The, it's really stylish, you guys should all buy one. And uh, this is showing all of the slots for this action. So previously you would only see the animation for one thing and you would have to go to the dope sheet to see the animation uh, for other things. And this is still limited to only showing the animation for, the a for one action, but since we can now store animation data for more than one thing in an action, you see more than one thing here. So we have the camera motion slot, the camera zoom slot, and the hat slot. And in this case, the camera itself is using the camera motion slot, but its animation data is using the camera zoom slot, and the hat is using the hat slot. So there's uh, a couple of things to point out about this. Uh, one is that camera motion is not the name of the camera object, right? So slots have their own distinct names. You can name them whatever you want. Uh, these three slots could be called Bob, Sally, and Joe. They could be called uh, screwdriver, wrench, and hammer. It, you know, you can name them whatever you want. And what determines uh, which slot something is animated by is just which one is selected up here. So you can select whatever slot you want. Another thing uh, is when you click on this slot selector in this case, so we have these three slots. We have camera motion, camera zoom, and hat. If you click on the slot selector, who would expect there to be three slots shown there? We do way better. There's only two. <laughs> uh, and the reason is because every slot has an associated data type that it is intended to animate thing, uh, it, that is intended to animate. And you can see that in the icons here. So the camera motion slot is intended for objects. The camera zoom slot is intended for camera data. And then the hat is also intended for objects. But if you are animating materials, you would see like material icons here. And when you are selecting uh, which slot you want to animate, it will automatically filter based on the current data block type. So you only see the slots that are relevant to that data type. There are a couple of other places where you might want to select actions. Uh, and that is in uh, animation clips or uh, NLA strips, as you might know them. So you want to, <laughs> the NLA system. No, actually, so just, just to be clear, like the, the current animation system, including the NLA system, uh, it, amazing work that was uh, done by Joshua Lang and it served us really, really well over the years. Um, but we're just now updating it and uh, getting things right. Yeah, seriously, yeah, to Josh, yeah. But as with all software, you know, you uh, end up needing new functionality over time and uh, that's what we're addressing. Um, but anyway, so in the, uh, Animation strips, you also need to select which action goes to that strip. Now you also select the slot that goes with that strip. Uh, and also, action constraints, which are one of my favorite things uh, as a ricker. Uh, they're really convenient, uh, really powerful. Uh, but it's just the same story here. Previously, you selected an action. Now you also select a slot. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about is, uh, well, 
can we make it a little more convenient uh, when you're selecting actions uh, to have the, you know, how you select the slots? So it could be that you select an action and then you have to manually go and select a slot every time. And you can absolutely do that. You can select the action you want and then manually select the slot you want. But in a lot of cases, uh, there's a fairly obvious slot that should be assigned to the particular object. So taking the fox and robot example again, if you have that slotted action that has a fox slot and a robot slot, and you're assigning the action to the fox, it's fairly obvious that it should probably be animated by the fox slot or the fox trot. <laughs> um, and so that's that's what we do. Just as a matter of convenience, uh, when you select an act, when you assign an action to something, uh, if there is an obvious slot uh, determined uh, primarily by the name uh, that should be assigned to it, it will just automatically assign, and you can override that afterwards. Uh, but just to make it a little easier when you're working with Blender. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Christoph to talk a little bit more about some of the slotted action stuff. <laughs> So um, Nathan talked about assigning actions to things, um, but if you try to do that in certain areas of Blender, you may like encounter a curiosity in Blender when there's like two, like might be two things in there. Um, you'd think it's only a mesh, but it's actually two data blocks. Um, so it's like the mesh and the shape keys. Um, so because each data block gets its own action, you get two um, two action selectors in there, and up to 4.3, those of course won't share an action by default. Um, and that's even though like shape keys are highly related to the mesh and they cannot be shared even. And I actually didn't know that they were a separate data block until I had to code with this. <laughs> um, but slots to the rescue, um, now they can actually use the same action just in different slots and everything works fine. Um, and this principle does not only apply to meshes and, and shape keys. There are certain other areas in Blender that have the same thing. For example, the material and its shader node tree, um, the world and its shader node tree, and certain other areas that you might encounter when you try to use slotted actions. Um, and that's all fun and games, but in order to make your lives easier, so talking to animators there, um, we implemented uh, like an automatic, automatic action sharing system. So, um, when you key something, it looks at things that are related, and if it finds an action on a related thing, it, it's going to use that action and just add a new slot to it. And what is related, like for example, an object and its data, as long as the data is not used more than once, um, mesh and the shape key obviously, material and shader node tree, and certain other things that we implemented, um, those will automatically just reuse the same action. And just to clarify, it doesn't matter in which order you key them, like you can key the shape key first and then the, the, the mesh data and the, the other way around and they will still get the same action. Um, so automation is finding is, is like really good, but I know animators, they are a crazy bunch and they will do things we can't anticipate. We can't automate that. So of course we need to allow for manual control. Um, so if you want to use a specific action on a data block, all you need to do is assign that action before you key anything. So we don't, like the, this automatic system only applies for the first key. Um, if there is already an action, Blender will just use it and put keys into it. Um, and if you happen to, I don't know, like key something, oh, I don't want this to be together. Um, there are already operators for this. So we have a merge operator. Let's say all your objects in the scene, they use different actions, but you actually want some of them to use the same action. You just select them and use the merge operator and they will, it will just collect all of them into a single action with separate slots. And this also goes into like related data as well. Um, so you select objects in the viewport, but it will obviously also like look at this data and like, for example, for the camera, the, the field of view will also be moved into the uh, same action. Um, the opposite is also possible. You can separate an action into uh, its separate slots. Basically, you explode the action. Um, so each, whereas you have an action with m multiple slots, afterwards you have one action with one slot, and 
that might be useful. And then for like more fine-grained control, you can go into the action editor and select a slot in the channel list. And there is an operator to like extract this single channel into a separate action as well. And that gives you the power to basically put everything into one action. Um, and some of you might want to do this. We are thinking of adding a preference to this to do this by default. Um, so like each scene would just have one action, for example. Um, but if you do this, you, like you have everything in one, one action, what happens if you open this file with an older version of Blender? Sibrin, tell us about it. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Christoph, for handing that hot potato to me. Um, so yeah, then, then, then uh, compatibility. So of course, when we're changing stuff, and it's not Blender 5.0 in which we change this. This is like in between major releases. Um, so we have to think, well, anyway, you have to think about compatibility, but especially when we do it now. Uh, so to answer your question, Christoph, uh, that won't work. Um, but there's a bunch of things that do work. And for compatibility, you have to look at forward and backward compatibility. Uh, let's start with backward first because it's backward. Um, so this means that what happens if I have an older Blend file and now I open it in Blender 4.4? What happens to my actions? And they will automatically be converted into slotted actions. So there is only one type of action in Blender 4.4 and later, and that is the slotted action. You will just get a single slot action with your F curves in there. It just behaves like, like an old action would. There's also a legacy Python API. So your add-ons will keep working with those single slot actions as they used to. The Python API that was there in Blender 4.3 and older just only sees the first slot and that's it. So it's a little bit blinded, it's a little bit limited, but at least it won't crash on you and it should just keep working until you start using the multi-slotting, which thanks to the action sharing that's automatic will happen sooner than later. Uh, but yeah. Also yesterday uh, I was talking with uh, Julien Tourou and probably will add an option to actually disable this backward compatible layer of the Python API so that when you're developing your add-on, you can be sure that if it works, it's not accidentally working because some bit of the code is still using the old stuff that will just crash on you and tell you it's wrong. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have forward compatibility, which is a bit newer in like Blender's development history to also think about forward compatibility. And that means what if I save Blender, like I open my Blend file with 4.4 alpha because I wanna, I wanna try it out, I'm curious. And then I save it and I, I realized I messed up my production file because it's now all slotted actions and the production is still using an older Blender. So I don't speak for anything else in the file, but at least the actions will be saved by Blender in a way that's compatible with older versions of Blender. So again, those older versions of Blender will only see the first slot in the action, but at least when you open the file, it gets converted to slotted actions. You save it again, it's still a single slotted action. And so that means that your old Blender will just see the animation data as it used to be. As long as you don't animate anything new, yep. But also this is why the manual control that Christoph explained is so important because you can explode your multi-slotted action into multiple single-slotted actions and then you can save and then you open again with Blender version old and you have your anim animation back. Maybe you need to reconnect some of the connections but at least your animation is there. Uh, avoid 4.2.0 because we made a little bit of a mistake there, uh, it's not doing well. Anything older than that or newer than that, like 4.2.1 is fixed, uh, 3.6 should also work, uh, 2.5 maybe also works. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, roughly it about slotted actions. Um, we also want to take a look at like what else? What else? We've been doing other stuff as well. Um, so just made a bit of a collage, like Blender 4.1 features. Um, the bone collections are now nestable, which is a lot easier to pronounce than hierarchical. Uh, 
They're nestable, but also you, they have a solo button now. So if you are animating and you have all your visibility set up nicely for that shot, but you still want to know what is in that particular uh, uh, collection, you can just solo it, you see it, and unsolo it and continue working. Um, baking animation, you can now actually specify which channels. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> I love this one. You can right click on an animated property, viewing graph editor, and then it just, if you have a graph editor on screen, it just zooms to that curve. <laughs> Thank you, Christoph. And like the rest is also Christoph. Uh, <laughs> motion paths. Oh, yeah. Motion paths can now be drawn in uh, camera space as well. So you visually see the... <laughs> and finally, uh, talking about baking, you can also bake individual curves now and just say, like, I want to bake it on fours, and, yes. but only that curve or the selected F curves instead of the entire action. <laughs> uh, this was a fun one. So you subdivide a bone, they're now named sensibly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is also uh, something that Nathan worked on. Uh, right click on a driver, copy to selected. Done. Uh. <laughs> then here we have a simple new framing option, just frame scene range, just the horizontal zoom, that's your scene range. Uh, small things, but it helps. Uh, you can already see the timer here. It's like six and a half minutes. Uh, that is graph editor speed up. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, you can do a whole animation by the time that Blender 3.6 has moved like 300 keys. Of course, heavy file, but still. Uh, and like, be careful. Like, watch closely there, because like 4.2 is like, yeah, done. <laughs> First is my Blender has crashed. <laughs> You can now set the width of custom bone shapes. So the important ones you can make stand out more and like on high DPI uh, images, like <laughs> monitors, you can just see more than one pixel. Uh, copy uh, global transform add-on has a fixed to camera uh, operator that helps when your camera is animated on ones and your objects are animated on twos. You got that strobing, uh, you can just click a button and now the strobing is gone. Um, doesn't work in all cases, but it's a very good start for many people anyway. Uh, in order to build this, um, we also introduce a new key type that's called generated. Because this inserts keys for you, like you have your keys animated on twos, and the add-on will insert new keys in between. But it needs to know that when you want to redo that, because you change the camera motion, which keys to delete and which keys to leave alone, and so that is when we introduce a new key type. So any tool is free to generate key types with type generated, and then they know what to nuke and to rebuild for you. And then finally, motion paths can set a separate color for before and after the current frame. <laughs> if 4.3, you can um, actually theme, theme that. My head said bonk. Um, we have a bone picker there. Uh, like this the, is but, an eye uh, uh, sorry, yeah, it's, it's, eye it's an eyedropper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the um, armature, you can just select an armature, and then you always have to type the bone name. Yes. <laughs> and now you can pick it. Uh, it's it's still limited. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> It's still limited, unfortunately, it's much harder to implement this when the armature is in object mode, which is where the initial question for that this came from. But at least now for pose mode, edit mode, where, yeah, that works. Um, inserting keys now deselects other keys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the uh, auto keying is now red when it's on and off, like, so it has more color. You can theme that as well if you don't like the red. Um, 
And then finally, in, in 4.3, you've already seen it, but there is actual action selectors in the properties panel. So now you can find, actually see which action is animating your material, your mesh, your whatever. Uh, not all the da like data block types that Blender has are shown in the properties editor, so there are still some hidden stuff, but at least everything that's in there now is visible and, and usable. So that's in the, well, upcoming 4.3. Now looking at the future. Um, we have uh, layered actions in the plan, as, as you saw. Um, this is not something we're going to work on immediately, but more about that. Um, last Tuesday, so the day before the conference, we had a workshop at Blender HQ talking about like what are layered actions? How are they supposed to work? Uh, simple things, like I start keying, where does my key go? And that like turned out to be like yeah, yeah, it's a choice, and this is a simplistic <laughs> version of it. Um, but it helped to just like reason about where should your key go. Um, it also made it clear that we have, will have a separate editor for managing your layers. So it's not like we probably won't be like stacking more stuff into the graph editor or the dope sheet is going to be a separate thingy probably. Uh, and so basically this is because it was last Tuesday and we don't have slides for it. Um, <laughs> we're going to make like a very minimal simple version first and just see what what works and what doesn't. Uh, that graph that I showed, maybe it it's very nice on paper and when you talk about it, when you use it in practice, it's shit. We don't know. We'll see. Um, and also, as I said, like the um, first we want to let the slotted actions rest for a bit. Give a few releases where people can work with it, get used to it, give us feedback, polish things before we start stacking more uh, advanced features on top of that. Um, also, our long-term goal is to fully replace the NLA. In order to do that, we need also non-linear support for layered actions. Um, and so we will also be adding strips. Again, that is for yet again later when the normal layered animation is working well and we have nice tooling to, to work with it. But then I have to tell you a little secret. Yeah. <laughs> Slotted actions are already a little bit layered. And the data model is there. And if you hack the Blender code and you take away some of the hard-coded limitations, you can actually do blending of, of stuff, but you just can't insert keys and, unless you know how to Python. Um, but right now, they're limited to one layer only. Um, and you don't see it. <laughs> And on that layer, we have a strip, but only one. And you don't see it, you can't move it. It's infinitely long, so you, you can't even not see the edges. They're not there. Um, but that one strip on that one layer is what actually contains these dumb bag of F curves for every slot. Um, and we intentionally put this whole data structure in there, even though it's a bit cumbersome now. Uh, but the Python API developers, like add-on developers, they, they have to take that into account already. And so already you can loop over the layers and you can loop over the strips and you can say, well, give me the, the F curves for this particular slot. Um, and hopefully that won't change when we start introducing more layers. And so there's only one big change instead of like incrementally every update breaking. That's of course our hope. We never know once we actually start working on it, how many things we have to change, we'll see. Um, so first uh, we give it a rest. We start working on like polishing existing stuff. Uh, there has been a lot of work on the brush assets project on saving brushes as individual blend files. So you can now right click on a brush in the asset browser and just say duplicate into that asset library. And then it saves a blend file that just contains that brush and not the whole UI and a scene and all the objects in it, etc. And we want that for the pose library as well, where you can just say, hey, I have a pose here, create pose in library, and it just creates it there for you. Same with updating, like right click on the pose, update from this pose, and then it should just be done. Um, 
the timeline controls. We want to move them to a footer so that they're available in every animation editor. <laughs> and then we're going to eat up the timeline editor because it's weird and we think nobody will use it ever again if those few controls that you can't find anywhere else, you can actually find everywhere else. And then, well, future future, uh, layered animation, a minimap, which is actually the actual bone picker that we also want to be able to use for lighting or selecting cameras or other operations. So we can't call it bone picker because we want it to be more generic than that. So I'd like RTS games, like strategy games, where you have this little minimap. So that's why we dubbed it the minimap. Uh, we want to have rig nodes. There is a prototype already, but it's really, really, really hackish. Um, slappable rigs that you can just slap on there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, declarative constraints, I, I would love to have in there, it, which is they currently constraints say uh, this prop copies the transform of this hand. And it's a unidirectional thing. And with declarative constraints, I mean a constraint that says this prop has to have the same uh, transform as this hand in a bidirectional way. So I drag the prop and the hand comes along and I drag the hand and the prop comes along. They, I think that might be nice. I don't know how to implement it yet, but it's, it's on the list. Um, we would love to create like interactive story tool where you have like different actions that can be triggered from, I don't know, certain sensors in the, in the scene. Uh, sort of bringing back a little bit more of like what used to be the game engine, but then instead of being a completely separate project in a blender, same Blender jacket, actually as a feature in Blender. And combined with that, a separate physics clock so that you can like scrub through your animation as the physics clock goes along, or you can just pause it at a frame, tell the cloth sim to just put the jacket on the character, and now I stop that clock again, and that animation can continue. Or for a set building where you just drop a bunch of bricks in a corner instead of hand placing them one by one. Um, and then finally, it's last on the list because I have a nice video to show where we really needed this, but uh, animation level constraints. Where in the action it also says which uh, constraints there are and what their properties are, so that you can do stuff like this. And this was a shot where there was lots of constraints between things and the dog had to drag them and it had to come along with it. Uh, that was not in the main rig of the dog, of course, or in the like in the set itself, because the animators were figuring out what to do and which constraints to put in there. But then that goes into the lighting file, as I already said, and then something changes in the animation, so that to tweak a constraint, and then you have to remember to tweak the same constraint in the lighting file, and that's very messy. So if we could put those constraints into the action instead of the scene or directly on the object, that'll just be, I think, a lot nicer to work with. Um, and yeah, that's roughly our plans. And to answer the first question, no, this will not all be done by 2025. <laughs> it, it was called later, later for a reason. So the paid development force that is actually paid through Blender Foundation is Nathan and Christoph and me like working three days, four days, or four days a week. And that's it. So we don't have that many people. Uh, we have help from the community. But still, we try to take small steps so that every step is useful by itself and we can put in a release and then look at the next thing. Uh, also, shaping all of this, especially the layered animation, once we actually start like having design discussions about this again, it, it wasn't just this workshop. So I would invite people to just come and join a module meeting sometime. We have them every Thursday at a certain time. Sometimes we have them on Tuesdays another time, just in case the regular time doesn't suit you. Uh, the agenda for that is on my website. That also has links to like where we publish the notes. The notes have the links to where this the Blender chat channel, uh, where we do the video meetings, all that kind of info. So this is a nice short URL that you can follow the reference from. So thanks again, and does, I think we have some time for questions.
Yes. So to repeat the question, can we isolate slots in the action editor and just look at one? Yes, there's a button for it that is, says active object slot only, and then you just get that. So how does that interact with, say, if there's camera, the camera motion slot, but there's also the camera focus slot? So related slots are, at the, at the moment, like we did not change how uh, objects work, sorry, how the action editor works. We just added like <laughs> slots to actions. But we still have this legacy thing where the action is uh, just showing the data of the active object. And so he was asking about what about the related things? What about that camera zoom? Yeah, currently that's a different slot, so it won't show. And so this filter is only useful for object uh, animation at the moment. I would love to have like a better way to maybe pin an action where the action has nothing to do with any object. You just want to see in the action editor that action that is animating the material, for example. Can I say something? Uh, so everything he said. Uh, the other thing, though, is that the way the action editor currently works uh, pre 4.4, where you select an object and you just see that object's action. Uh, that is useful, but it's also only one useful way of filtering what you're looking at. And it's very limited. And so I think just in general, we want to move forward uh, with a much more flexible, powerful filtering system in general. So you have more ways of filtering, your, filtering the animation data you're looking at than just, oh, this object or the whole scene or things like that. Just give more flexibility in general. Okay. One more thing I forgot. Yeah, I will get to you soon. One thing I forgot to mention. Um, Actions are now themselves no longer limited to animating like one type of data. It used to be that you have an action for materials and an action for objects and they cannot intermix. Now with the slots, that has moved to slots as, as Nathan explained. But the side effect of this is that every action becomes assignable to an object. And so even though the action is not animating an object, you can still assign it. And then maybe Blender sees only material slots. Well, that's fine. It won't automatically pick a slot for you. The object won't be animated by that action, but the action is assigned. And so you can see it in the action editor anyway. And that is a way to see your material slots, for example, in the action editor to inspect your actions. Just add a cube, assign the action to it, and you can see it. Yes. So is it possible to nest actions effectively? No, like I, or, I have an action with all my things, but maybe I only want in the two characters hugging to have an action containing a linked version of only one of the characters, if that makes sense. Perhaps in another file, perhaps so I can library override um, some of the channels to change, to have almost the exact same hugging action, but maybe only one of the characters and then something maybe in the material changes if it's a memory all of a sudden or something like that. All right, so how to summarize that. Basically, how does it work with library overrides and what can I override and what yes. not? So can I just um, slot into it? At, at this moment, uh, you cannot override anything within the action, but once you override your character, you can tell it to use a different action or a different slot. So even when those characters had shared the one action with the, the shared animation in there, you can still tell one character to just use another action uh, and then it just gets animated by that and you will see the slot that it used to have will sit there a bit grayed out and it says unassigned after it and it was a little bit sad but you pointed it somewhere else so uh, in the future we hope that with layers you could say um, with an override add another layer on top uh, maybe mute a layer and then animate it again or just do some tweaks, but that's for the for the layered animation. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that when you make or when you auto key stuff, or a lot of things will have automatically, like a name for stuff and stuff like that. Is that just based off the object name, or where, where does that name come from? 
Okay, so the question is, if Blender auto creates a slot, where does the name come from? Uh, yeah, it's just the thing that you were keying. So if you were keying an object called cube, it will create a slot called cube. Is there, a way to, is there a way to turn that off? No. In exactly the same way that when you do shift A mesh cube in the 3D viewport, you will get a cube called cube. Yeah. And you want to rename it, you rename it. That's fine. But the automatic find, like automatic creation of that name, well, you have to name it something because otherwise your slots are all empty and then it's useless. But you can just name them whatever. So the question or suggestion is basically like, could we have a numerical identifier for a slot instead of the name? That's actually how it works. <laughs> we didn't say so, but internally, every slot has a, has a number that's unique within the action that won't be reused. So when you create a bunch of slots and then delete them and then create a bunch of new ones, those new ones will get a different number. And internally, the assignment of that slot works with that number. So even when you have an action in one file and then you link it into, say, your lighting file and then your lighting object, your render object, points to a certain slot. If the animator goes in to the anim file and changes the slot name, the lighting file will still work because internally it's using that number that the animator cannot touch. And that is what is creating that relationship. And so the slot name is only used for display purposes and for automatic selection when you flip to a different action. It will just store on the thing whatever slot name it was using uh, when you unassign. And then when you reassign, it will look up, was there a slot with the same name I was using before? Yes. Okay. Use it. Um, I think we have to shut down. So I've, there is one more quick question. Otherwise, just approach us, talk about it, and join the modern meetings. Thank you, Brad. If there's no more, thank you very much.